Hello and welcome to What Is It About the Weather? Where weather is always the theme, but not often the topic, because there's much more to weather than weather itself. Welcome, whether it's a return visit or if you're a new listener, we're glad to have you on board. Now, you're thinking to yourself, hey Mark, you know, last week you did an audio episode. You've been flipping it up, audio, video, audio, video. Well, we're going to try something new here for the fourth quarter of 2016, and we're going to do audio only on the podcast stream. Based on, you know, most of the episode ideas I've been getting and even some feedback from uh, listeners as well, the podcast, it's, it's easier to absorb. You can kind of get it wherever you want. Some of the podcatchers aren't even set up well for video as well. So we're just going to, we're going to try this transition for three months, see how it goes and, you know, make a decision as we start the new year from there. Doesn't mean that we couldn't flip an audio episode in every now and then. And of course the cloud series and the short series will uh, continue on YouTube as they have all along. And that's not going to change. They just, you know, as before they weren't part of the podcast feed and they will continue not to be um, going forward. So audio for the next couple months, hope, hope you can bear it. Now, the main topic today for us is going to be weather and technology. Before I get into that, you know, when we left last week, Matthew was kind of barreling down on the U.S. coast, and it's been a big news story. There's still people dealing with the aftermath and floods that continue as rivers are just, you know, now beginning to peak in many areas. So, it, you know, it's that reminder, with especially with things like hurricanes, that it's not always the wind, and quite often the wind is not the biggest destructive element of it. It's the rains that come with it. Now, again, it depends where you are, of course, as to what the most destructive element is, but it's a reminder that, you know, it, it's not always, you don't shouldn't always think about what do I do, what decision do I make based on this very strong wind event. Now, I even, as I was in the mountains of, of the southeast U.S. this past weekend, dealt with some of the the wraparound winds from this storm and it was an element in even where I was in terms of impacting events that were going on however you know in contrast the coastal areas of the U.S. and lowland areas of the U.S. near the coast are dealing with these you know incredible flooding issues so just be aware that there there are different pieces and you know you kind of need to think of storm events and in their totality not in their individual components and it was even weird with Matthew I think most probably the most I don't know if it was foretelling image I saw was there's this incredible satellite imagery and I'll put a link in the show notes that shows this kind of skull menacing skull looking face and it is a real picture I mean it's it's not something that was photoshopped or made up and it's right as the eye is crossing over Haiti and I, I don't know maybe you know with that first landfall maybe it was telling us something about what was going to happen so enough about Matthew let's let's move on to weather and technology now you know, as I mentioned before, technology is kind of my, my first career, and you know, I got out of college and went to work for IBM and have worked for a variety of other companies and done a lot of things in the technology field, and I still, you know, delve in technology constantly today. I was working on some website stuff just yesterday, so uh, I like it. I enjoy dealing with it, and I really like when weather and technology come together, and we're going to touch on this topic, like I said, multiple times, and it's you know it's been interesting how much meteorology has really driven the elements of technology for years. Whether it's you know supercomputers that were needed to do weather modeling, whether it's you know, even think about it today, your phone that you hold and all the weather information it can get uh, and send out. And we we've gotten into this age of ultra local or hyper local information and you know these phones have made it possible and you know big companies as well like I why, why did IBM buy the weather company you know an intriguing thought but they're not the only big company getting in the game so these are all things that we'll come back to but before I I delve into the the newer tech or what you would consider the modern tech, yeah, I thought we'd take a step back because as much as we like to think about technology being related to computers, and a lot of us do that, I mean, you know, it's the term has become much associated with the modern era and particularly with computer or computer related types of things. However, technology and the concept of technology has been around a long time and 
when you think about humans in general, when, when you go back to our very, very basic instincts, right? At the core, what was the goal of, of any human, right? Survival. And, I, and that's even true today. I mean, we don't have to always deal with the same things. Again, it depends where you are. There's a lot of parts of the world where survival is still key. And, you know, I mean, just basic fundamental survival. But at the element of that, inside that survival, you know, there's there's the reproduction element and there's the communication elements that, that are critical to survival. But at a very fundamental level, even within that core basic instincts, are food and safety, really. You know, how am I going to feed myself and how am I going to stay alive, right? And sometimes stay alive is fighting off uh, predators or it could be fighting off, you know, other people, you know, depending on what day and age we're talking about and what was going on. But one key element of safety is protection from weather, right? So we've always had this need to not get struck by lightning, not freeze to death, not, you know, not deal with hypothermia, not be flooded out of where we're living. All these things have been real since, you know, we've been walking around doing this thing we do on this planet. And, the technologies that have come out of that have helped shape our ability to do that. Now, you know, early technologies, when you think about it, right, when you go back to, again, back to that survival thing, and, and I guess I should define what I consider technology. And, you know, there are different definitions. And like I said, a lot of very focused in the modern age. But think of it really in, in a mindset of it's the application of knowledge for solving a, a practical need, Okay, so let's say you need to, uh, I don't know, kill a bison to get the fur and have the meat and all that stuff. And, you know, you're not going to try to run up and and just pull him down. You don't have the speed to do that. So inventing some sort of tool with with a sharp point on it to throw at that bison and hopefully bring it down, that's what you're going to look to do. So those were the kind of the early tools. But like I said, within that, We started doing things like developing clothing, creating shelters to stay in. And those things were more weather-focused, right? It was to protect you from the elements, as as we would say. So certainly we could talk about those things. And, you know, they're they're interesting, but a lot of times they were multi-purpose, you know, whether it was clothes or shelter. They they, they had more to it than just the weather element, right? It, It wasn't... Um, their sole purpose. And so I, I thought an interesting aspect of it, though, was you know, maybe there was something more like a tool, more of a mobile component that, you know, wasn't just for keeping, you know, if you look at a boot, for instance, yeah, it may keep your feet from getting wet, but it may also keep your feet from getting pierced by stone. So again, kind of that, that dual purpose thing. So I, I was going back through and I was like, what, what you know, one thing was there that maybe stood out that was really weather centric you know you could really put your hand to it and say yeah it may have served another purpose but its primary very fundamental purpose was some tool in interacting with weather and lo and behold the thing that came to mind was umbrellas right so it's an intriguing thing umbrellas have been around you know if if you look back through the history and what we understand and you know based on any sort of documentation we have on these things they, they've been around at least at least since you know somewhere between three and four thousand bc uh, there is known elements in egypt and again we get back to what was the purpose in the beginning so the purpose in the beginning seems to have been very focused on not rain protection as we think of it more often today but very focused on sun protection right so to keep people in the shade the Egyptians at that time were, you know, it was to have fairer skin, and this kept the sun from from beating down on them. So that was going on. Now, there is some question as to whether it was first found in Egypt or maybe some other parts of the world. Certainly the Chinese had early editions of it as well. And the documentation doesn't seem to go back that far, but but who knows? I mean, there could be other other cases, but for sure it's been around thousands of years. And what is seems to be pretty sure, though, is the Chinese were the first to waterproof them and, and actually use them as a protection mechanism from rain or moisture. And add, you know, they they were very early adopters of of adding artwork to it and making it not only a practical item but a decorator item. Now, now let's be clear: back in the day, how these things were made and built 
they were mostly for the upper class or for the elite. And it, you know, it's hard for us to fathom that today when we think about, you know, you can go down to the dollar store and probably get an umbrella. It may not work but for one rain, but, but you can probably get one. So we've got to go back, though, and think about the fact that, you know, we, don't, we didn't have the tools today to make the materials that we use. And again, so technology evolving, other technology. But so back then, very, very much focused initially, like I said, on sun, very much focused on the elite and really was more of a women's thing. Now, we've all seen artwork over the years and its depiction of, you know, women with parasols, because that's really what it is. It's it's a it's a protection from the sun. Again, where its birthplace was very fancy, very ornate, all these different things going on with it. But you see very few cases of men ever having been. Now, that's not to say royalty didn't have um, staff who held up a parasol or a larger umbrella to protect them from the sun. But when we got down to items that were being used and carried around, most often, most often, our cultural representations of that have been women doing it. Okay, And we seem to have lost this technology in the dark ages of Europe now, that's a very European-centric view on it, I know. And for all we know, during this whole time, the Chinese were continuing to evolve it and use it just like they always had. And that's probably very true as well. But what we do know is, in terms of Western culture and its adaptation of the umbrella and transitioning to rain, it really was when the Renaissance era came about. So European places were getting it and using it more or as often for rain protection as they were for sun protection. I don't know, maybe I haven't looked at the climate of, of when this, when the Renaissance took place to look at see if there was more rain, but maybe there was more rain going on than sun. So they had a, a, need, a need to make and evolve that technology. But again, what we're talking about here is this was a technology, and as we often see with technology, it was evolving to a new thing, right? And most technologies have, you know, whether it's the wheel that went from a stone wheel to wooden to you know, polymer rubbers or whatever it is that we use today on a car. So, you know, even simple technologies like an umbrella change over time and evolve over time. So let's talk about it. So we, let, let's, let's say we've jumped forward, okay? We've come out of the Renaissance age, or we're, let's say we're in the Renaissance age. And like I said, it was still a very much a female-focused device. And parasols, in a lot of the ones, or even the Chinese designs, were lighter. They were. They could be made with um, materials like bamboo and some other things like that, and light screens. Now, and this was the challenge, though. Those screens would provide sun protection, but to get the rain protection, you ended up quite often having to go into a much heavier device. And that's why, quite frankly, uh, you probably didn't see much of it in that day and age. Now, it became clear that you know this was changing, and probably. The transition to what we would call a more traditional umbrella came about in, you know, the late 1600s, 1700s, when it really became a device. And, and I don't even know any better way to describe it than imagining going and taking a, a modified version of a table umbrella today, one of those big old structures with a long pole, and carrying it around. But just keep in mind that it was built and upright, and you really didn't have necessarily the collapsible functionality or those things. It was built with wood. It was built with whale bones, some of these other things. It had to have thicker things or surfaces to it to repel um, the the rain off. Now, again, you would use a lot of things today. You would use an oil or something else, you know, much like an animal does, right? So many animals secrete oils that kind of make them waterproof. And, the, and so the same thing was being done with umbrellas. Now, a well-known individual by the name of Jonas Hanway, and this is kind of the modern British or, uh, umbrella, and, and I guess my, my understanding is some people still call them Hanways today, you know, much like you would call a tissue a Kleenex or something, just because he's so synonymous with it. But he was kind of the first man. Now, again, clearly documentation showing other men having carried umbrellas before then, but the first man that walked around with it on a regular basis, and it, Again, keep in mind, the UK, one of those areas that gets a, a, a fair amount of moisture uh, in the London area, etc. And so 
He was well known for years of walking around. A lot of people called him a fool and everything else, but he was carrying this big 10 pound plus umbrella around. I, I think I might have had some some words that weren't so nice to him going, yeah, you're crazy. I'll, I'll wear a hat or some other clothes. And, and again, most of the repelling was done with, with certain clothes, but it was catching on. And more and more people following this man's example were going, hey, this this actually works. Yeah, it's heavy, and I'm sure you didn't want to carry it everywhere, but on a really rainy day, it probably did a much better job. I don't know, even today when I think about when I have certain windbreakers that are supposed to be water-resistant, well, they are, but you get a good rain, and all of a sudden you're soaked, right, because that water really creeps through. So that went on for a while, but it really wasn't, like I said, it was still really a heavy device, and it wasn't until the mid-1800s, and a gentleman by the name of Samuel Fox was credited with inventing the steel-ribbed umbrella. Now, there are cases seen where steel may have been used prior to that, but this person is really credited with the steel, you know, skeleton-oriented umbrella that, that kind of we know today, but it was in its very beginning form, right? So this drastically brought the weight down of an umbrella. And the Fox Company still makes umbrellas today. I'll have a link in the show notes. And they have some of this history information available. You know, that was one of the funny things. There is no shortage of talking about umbrellas on the Internet. And I was kind of surprised. You know, I, I didn't figure there'd be nothing about it. But how many pages does this have an umbrella history page? And, of course, these umbrella companies do as well. So this guy, steel, steel ribbed umbrella. Then we would probably go another, uh, let's say, 70 years or so before Hans Haupt in Berlin developed the first telescoping or foldable umbrella, right? And so this was another huge step. And that would be, you know, step on in, you know, other locations in the U.S., to the Totes brand, some very famous patents on the first they called the first folding working umbrella. I don't, you know, I looked at all these things and tried to understand what the differences were. I don't, I don't fully know. But in any case, it's it continued to evolve and become more advanced, become lighter, which was key. But, you know, some of the things, as, as with all things, it's, again, it's evolving. It got more convenient. It got lighter and easier to carry around. But some of the challenges still exist. And, and trying to, in this day and age, deal with some of the things, particularly like adding high wind to the rain element. Yeah, I want to protect from rain, but how many people haven't been a victim to a folding umbrella and a really, you know, big storm and that sort of thing. So that's where a lot of the focus is today, you know, is creating ones that can hold up to anything. And you'll see, you know, professional golfers, and they have these big fancy umbrellas uh, that are a big investment, but generally they protect them in the wind. Now, you know, and, and there are, there are different styles. For instance, the Totes brand makes this one of these ones that came out. It's not a new thing. That's kind of a clear plastic that almost in, in Put you in a bubble, I guess. I was going to say encompasses you in a bubble, but it really just you know envelops the top part of you. I guess you're not, but you could you're actually looking through the plastic. So how we deal with the elements is still changing what we do because people, even with those nicer ones, want a lighter one, but they also want to know it's going to work. But as with a lot of technologies, it's also reached the kind of the development part of the cycle where it's a commodity product, right? And this, you know, think about it. And I, I watched it with personal computers in my early career that went from tens of thousands of dollars to, you know, where we buy them now and they're under a thousand dollars. And quite frankly, and it's evolved in, in how we carry it. I mean, you think about the mobile phone, the mobile phone is no longer, we don't talk on them as much as we use it as our little walking computer, right? And, and weather gathering information device. So the same thing has happened with umbrellas. So we've got this divergence where we have the convenience factor. Like I said, go to a dollar store, pick up one, or come out of the metro station in Santiago. And, you know, there, there's always, because there's so few cases of rain in the year, there's always people selling paragua, paragua. You'll hear them everywhere when you're coming out of the metro. And, you know, it's this convenience thing. It's like, oh, I forgot my umbrella. Well, but I can get one for, you know, a couple dollars. I'll buy one and add it to the mix of all these other umbrellas I stored up over time. So we've got that end of it, and then we've got, like, the other end I discussed, of people who want, and, and you can. You can go and buy umbrellas that have a lifetime guarantee, and, you know, if you have any problem with it, you send it back. And, you know, it all boils down to how much are you really out in the elements, right? 
how much do you really need that protection for how you're going to take the technology? Am I going to buy the cheap thing? Am I going to buy the fancy thing? You know, is it in style again? So some of these things are in style. And actually what we're seeing a resurgence of in, in many cultures, and I've seen it more in the past few years, is more people again and again using the umbrella for sun protection. And it's become fashionable to do that again. So the technology is evolving to incorporate all those elements. Right, so we've got the convenience, we've got what kind of weather elements you in, and all these things continue to evolve a technology that's been around for thousands of years. Kind of cool. I, you know, most of the other technologies I'm going to talk about won't go back that far because before there were computer models plotting the weather, people were doing it on paper. So, you know, the technology really started only so long ago. So, I hope you've enjoyed this kind of dive into the, the umbrella world. Yeah, it, it was interesting in, in looking at all this stuff. I mean, think about it. Umbrella, how many how many paintings have you ever seen where an umbrella or a parasol is is linked into it somehow? I mean, even Rihanna most recently in the past couple of years was singing about her umbrella, right? And there's multiple songs. I found a, a website that had 23 songs that either had umbrella in the title or it was mentioned was some good songs. Some of them I might need to add to that, that weather uh, list I have out on YouTube. So... Been around a long time, really neat technology, and certainly intertwined with, at a very basic instinct, protecting you from the weather elements. All right, so as I close out here with the under umbrella, interesting tidbit. So one of the articles I read about was conveying how many patents there have been. If you do a, they said if you do a Google search, the word umbrella shows up 120,000 times, and that's just the U.S. Patent Office, okay? One of the ones that made me laugh, though, it had to be, is the interesting tidbit is there is actually a patent for a misting umbrella. That's right. You heard it. An umbrella that protects you from the rain and will also rain on you. So, you know, go do a search on that. It, it was kind of humorous, but I can't actually see on a hot, sunny day where having the rain under the umbrella might be a very useful thing. So, all right, let's wrap up this episode now. Future episodes, I, you know, I, I, I've mentioned we're going to do some UFO weather. That's certainly coming. And uh, some weather, I want to do some weather sayings and some of the goofy weather sayings you, you might hear about. And I'm going to, like I said, one of the other things I'm going to be looking at in, in some of the future episodes is adding this uh, could it happen sort of thing. So non-aqueous rain. I, I don't know if I'm going to do this as a single episode or if I'm going to do it as closing things, but people, you know, people always ask, could this happen? Or, or they see some event in a movie and want to know, is, is it possible sort of thing? Non-aqueous rain. We've heard about it for years, you know, fr frogs falling from the sky, fish falling from the sky. But really, could a Sharknado occur? And so we're going to delve into that on in some episode. And I, and I do think even if we have a tidbit of could it happen, I might start off with an introductory episode. So, you know, keep a keep an ear out for that. Next couple of weeks, we'll probably do a couple of those types of things. And on that note, we'll wrap up here. Now, I, I want to give a quick shout out to my nephew, Gabe, who has launched a website this week called The Front Yard Scientist. And I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes if you want to go. But I, I always look at these things. When I was growing up, Science, the STEM schools were not available. And while I had science in school, you know, it just so much of our culture doesn't focus on that. I'm glad to see any kid. And, and, and it was it's neat to see that because he and I have had a chance to go out and do some astronomy stuff together. And he's really into that. He's really into his engineering classes. And I just think about all these things I didn't have growing up. Right. And I'm so glad that he's able to take advantage of those things and that we live in a day and age where more I think it's more acceptable and encouraged to enter the scientific fields and engineering fields that it has been in the past. Now, that may just be the family I grew up in, and I understand that, that I didn't grow up in an engineering family, for instance, like my wife's family, where that was a little more commonplace. But in any case, just, you know, go take a look at his website. It's got some neat stuff on what he's doing with some of his class projects and some of the astronomy stuff he's doing, so you might enjoy that. Now, when it comes to us, what is it about the weather? You know the ways to get us, right? But if you're new to this, what is it about the weather at gmail.com? Email me, show ideas, feedback, whatever it might be. That's how you can get me. Now, fundamentally, how to keep up with the podcast, 
how to get information about supporting the podcast or following, you know, Facebook feeds or Twitter feeds or Instagram feeds. All that is on the website at whatisitabouttheweather.com. And like I said, you know, that, that could be, you know, the Google photo album that I put together, or it could be, you know, following the show's uh, Twitter feed so that you get announcements about the show and some of the topics. Like for this, this, this coming week, I'm sure I'll send some tweets out related to some umbrella information. So you may be an umbrella overload by this time next week. And also on the website, of course, is the support element. So what is about the weather.com slash support where you can learn all about the RSVP method that you've heard me mention before rate, share, validate, and pledge. And the many ways that you can help us continue on with this journey. So until next time, till next time, may you have interesting, exciting, enjoyable, and of course, safe weather. <laughs>